Hey, good evening. This is from the porch with Kevin Stoda at the Kevin Stoda channel. Hope you like us. Um, we've been going over some articles. This one is about the last voices of World War II. It's been 75 years since uh, World War II ended. And um, there are veterans still around. And I wanted to share some of them with you. Uh, the National Geographic spent time finding people from all kinds of different countries. I'll give you some examples here. Um, uh, they're telling their own stories. They were specifically these people. And the man on the cover is Lawrence Book. He's 110 years old. He's the oldest uh, living vet from World War II. Let's start with uh, a German until Wolfgang Brockman. Wolfgang Brockman. It says here, a young Russian soldier came out of the bushes without weapons, hands up, already bandaged, injured. He must have been completely lost. I would have said, go back, get out of here. But an older soldier immediately pulled out his gun and shot him. That was against all my ideas of surrender. But these are the horrors of war, which turns humans into monsters. Brockman, now 93, was 12 years old in 1939 when Germany invaded Poland and ignited World War II. Hitler was his idol, and he itched to get in the fight. When he did, late in the war, he saw atrocities that were against all the morals I felt as a German soldier. He ended the war in Soviet captivity, the worst case scenario, he says. So uh, that's what Hitler got him, and, and he's lifted up as uh, one of Hitler's uh, supporters. Uh, another supporter of World War II is this man, the Japanese. His name is Nobuo Nishizaki. He's a Japanese veteran. Uh, he says, we were sent to die for the emperor and imperial nation, and everyone acted like we believed in it. But when the soldiers were dying, the young ones called out to their mothers and the older ones called out to their children's names. I never heard anyone calling the emperor and the nation when they died. Leaving home for the Navy in 1942, uh, Nishizaki, then 15, was given an order by his mother. You must survive and come back, she said. He clung tightly to her words, even as the winds of war swept him across the Pacific from one battle to the next and finally to a suicide mission at Okinawa. Despite long odds, he lived and honored his mother's demand. This is Vera, excuse me. This is Vera. Vera Nikitina, Leningrad blockade survivor. survivor. I don't want to remember any of it, even to speak of it. It's all so hard. I don't want that anyone would ever have to suffer such a thing again. When I talked of my childhood, I get upset. I start to cry. I don't want to cry anymore. I want to live the rest of my life in peace and see only the good in life. I don't want to see anything terrible anymore. Nikitina 87 was a child when the 900 day Nazi blockade of Leningrad began. Having already lost her mother and with her father off at war, she was quickly evacuated from the besieged city. Nearly all of her relatives, though, uh, who couldn't escape, died in, in the Nazi stranglehold from hunger, cold, and bombings that claimed some 800,000 civilian lives. Um, I'm going to start reading a little bit more detailed about some of these people. Um, this is a famous person from World War II, but she wasn't famous until movies were made recently. Her name's Betty Webb. Uh, she worked for British Intelligence. Webb, 97, was 18 when she started work at Bletchley Park, Britain's top secret code-breaking center. German leaders believed messages encrypted by their Enigma machines. This model, uh, here's the model. This Enigma machine. Um, could generate 103 sextillion combinations and therefore were unbreakable. 
uh, let the uh, personnel prove them wrong very early in the war. I'll go ahead and read uh, Betty Webb's story, okay? I wanted to do more for the war effort than bake sausages. It was in that room there that I signed an official Secrets Act. Betty Webb, 97 points with her walking stick to a ground floor room in the Bar baronial mansion at Bletchley Park. Uh, Britain's largest uh, top secret code breaking facility during World War II. Through the bay window, a massive desk is visible. There was a senior intelligence officer seated at that desk, she says. I remember he had a handgun lying casually beside him, right where that coffee cup is now. I was told to sign and made to understand in no uncertain terms that I could never, never discuss anything about my work here with anyone. I signed it with a sobering moment. It was a sobering moment. It was eight, I was 18 at the time. Um, yeah, I think we've seen uh, several Code Breaker movies come out in recent years. It's amazing these tough people are still around, huh? Um, it was 1941. Britain was at war. German troops had already run much, overrun much of Europe. Webb had been taking a home economics course, but joined Auxiliary Territorial Service, the Women's Army, because, as she put it, I wanted to do something more than make baked sausage rolls. Webb was bilingual. She'd grown up with a German au pair and had been an exchange student in Germany. So she was ordered to report to Bletchley an hour or so north of London. It was so secret I had no idea what it was. Nobody did, let alone what I was getting into. Initially, Webb was put to work cataloging the thousands of encrypted German radio messages that British listening posts were intercepting each day. But as the war progressed, she moved to a more creative role, paraphrasing priceless nuggets of intelligence gleaned by the code breakers, so, uh, the code breakers, so no one could suspect it had been obtained by broken codes she would be paraphrasing. In other words, um, putting it in a language that wasn't uh, clearly from the text. We had to make it sound as though it was information we'd picked up from the spies or stolen documents or aerial reconnaissance, she said. The fact that we'd broken Germany and Japan's military codes was a closely guarded secret, known only to a very few people. Webb enjoyed the work. I liked the deviousness of it, she smiled. She also worked on intercepted Japanese messages and was so good at paraphrasing their content that in June 1945, after the war in Europe ended, she was sent to Washington to help the American war effort in the Pacific. I flew over in a flying boat, she recalls. It was the first time I'd ever been on a plane. I sent my parents a postcard from Washington. I'm sure they must have wondered what I was doing, but of course they never asked, and anyway, I could never tell them. Decades would pass before any of the people at Bletchley were allowed to speak of their work during the war. Both my parents had died by then, so they never knew, she says. All the secrecy made it tough to get a job after the war, especially for the men, since you couldn't tell employers anything about your war years other than that you'd worked at some place called Bletchley Park. Webb eventually found work at a school whose headmaster had been at Bletchley. I never knew him at the time, she says, but when he saw on my application that I'd been at Bletchley too, no words needed to be said, no awkward questions asked, I got the job. She was lucky. Uh, in contrast, here is a uh, Russian officer. Her name is Maria Roklina. Maria Roklina. It says, we did not bury dead bodies in the winter in Stalingrad. Corpses were piled up. There was no place to bury them. Um, the fighting ended 75 years ago, but Maria Roklina, now 95, still feels the war in her hands. In every finger born in Ukraine, she dreamed of becoming a pilot. But by 1941, when she was 16, the Nazis were advancing deep into her homeland. I stepped from my school desk into the war, she says. She became a combat medic and served with the Soviet forces for four years. One day as she was helping ferry a wounded soldier across the roiling Dnieper River, her oar broke so she uh, paddled through the bone chilling water with her bare hands. 
The pain in her fingers is still so severe that she takes injections in each joint for relief. In 1942, Roklina became trapped in the besieged city of Stalingrad. The battle raged for six more months, reducing the city to ruins and decimating its population. Winter temperatures regularly plunged below zero degrees Fahrenheit. Roklina holed up with Soviet troops in a tractor factory, but there wasn't a scrap of paper or wood to burn. We had to warm each other with our bodies, she says. We took an oath there, never to forget Stalingrad, never to forget those who stood hugging each other in what she calls warming circles. Then there are the memories of Roklina uh, that have to be forgotten, but can't. The heat of a dying soldier's intestines as she tried to push them back into his abdomen. Or a fellow medic who was raped and killed by the Germans, her breast sliced off. I cannot forgive them for that. But like the heating circles, the horrors forged bonds. A Soviet soldier on the first side of her promised he would return to marry her. They stayed married for 48 years. There are many other stories in here. Um, is one gentleman. His name is Yevsi Rudinsky. He was a Soviet navigator. The war came for Yevsi Rudinsky, a student and gymnast, when he was sent to a re recruiting station and was told the country needed 100,000 pilots. I didn't dream of aviation, but I really liked to study, said Rudinsky, now 98 years old. Uh, drawn to charts and astronomy, he trained to become a navigator in Russia's far north, where polar pilots uh, taught their inexperienced charges to orient in treacherous weather without reliable maps. His baptism into combat came in the skies above Kursk, scene of the world's biggest tank battle. I flew a dive bomber, uh, Petlakov PE-2. We lovingly called it Peshka, meaning a chest pawn. He recalls fear only after landing. When you see how many holes you have in your plane or how the Messerschmitt attacked you, then you start to feel, he adds. If you feel nothing, you're not human. And in the end, we are all human. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing for a minute and uh, encourage you to talk to people who are living, who know about World War II or World, uh, the Korean War or Vietnam War. Um, we're getting to be older and it's time to really find out what battles really like and also talk to the soldiers today. We need to help our vets. Uh, a lot of them have PTSD, but a lot of people came back from war with PTSD too. Thank goodness there was a good economy in the United States, but not so in other places. And um, they had to overcome that too. Um, this is Kevin Stoda. I'm on the porch and uh, this is the Kevin Stoda channel. I hope you like it. Have a good day.